Today on The Principal's Office. The dreams of tomorrow are being accomplished by real-life superheroes today. Men and women whose achievements in science, technology, engineering and math are shaping our future. But how many of them do you know? That's why Brainstem University was started. An educational initiative combining cutting-edge technology and leading figures in STEM, inspiring learning, imagination, and passion to solve our greatest global challenges. Because if we support a black student in STEM, then he or she can change the world. STEM education creates critical thinkers, increases science literacy, and enables the next generation of innovators. Do you need proof? Well, then look no further than today's guest, Ricky Mason from Louisville, Kentucky, born and raised. Ricky graduated from the University of Kentucky with a bachelor in electrical engineering. He went on to get his master's in computer engineering from John Hopkins University only to come back to UK and get his doctorate in electrical engineering. And so we're so happy because after he finished UK the second time, he went on to work for the CIA, the Department of Defense, NASA, and the University of Kentucky. He wanted to start his own business and he started Brain STEM University, and that's what brought him to our show today. Please welcome with me Dr. Ricky Mason to the principal's office. Welcome. Thank you for having me. While I served as principal here in Louisville, um, I heard about this guy that had been to NASA and knew that anybody that had been to NASA and was a black male we wanted to have in the face of our students hopefully generate something in you and in your children that instills in them a desire to move forward in the STEM category. So why get into um, educational technology advancements? Well, I think you hit on it um, right up front was it just inspired me to do all of these things was first um, when I was a kid um, in the fifth grade I had the opportunity to meet a robotics engineer at my school and just from that one experience I told my mom like mama I don't know what I want to do up to this point but I think I want to be a robotics engineer and um, I went and started researching that I just felt inspired from that and the next thing it led me in, into space so the best robots and the coolest robots were being produced as space rovers. So I'm like, I want to get into that. That's what I want to do. So um, that's kind of what led me into STEM and got me started. And then full circle, and then full circle, that's also the reason why I started. Um, Brain STEM University, um, while I was working at the University of Kentucky, we really struggled to recruit and retain STEM students, and particularly students of color. And for me, I had to go back and like, why did I get into STEM? Like, why was I so excited about this? Why was I, you know, so driven? Um, when I look back, it was just from that very beginning, um, having that early exposure to STEM. And I realized um, up until I got to college, I really didn't have very many opportunities to participate in STEM uh, before, you know, from that one experience I had. And that experience there was even a, that was a gem for me. The only reason I felt like I had that opportunity is because I had a family that gave me a scholarship to, get, um, to send me to a private school. Mm -hmm. And that's where I had that experience where I met that robotics engineer. Mm -hmm. Had I been at my regular school, I probably wouldn't have had that opportunity to meet that robotics engineer that kind of inspired me. So full circle with Brainstem, coming back and I want to inspire kids early. You know, give them that, you know, first um, dream of, you know, being an astronaut like I had, the first dream of, you know, launching a rocket, um, and then, you know, giving them the ability to chase that dream um, and creating that pipeline that we're building with Brainstem. So um, that's the real goal of why I'm back in ed tech and, um, started, and I started Brainstem is just to really inspire kids to dream farther, dream, create, and innovate. That's kind of our slogan. And that's what engineering did for me and gave me the opportunity to dream, create, and innovate. And when you had that first experience, 
uh, were you actually introduced to a robotics engineer and that term was used or did you come to learn that later? Um, no, they came in, introduced himself as a robotics engineer and kind of discussed all of the things that you needed to do to become a robotics engineer. So he's like, well, I had to learn programming. He had to learn mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. So with that in mind, what did I do when I went to college? I was a triple major. <laughs> I majored in electrical engineering, computer engineering, oh, and computer science. Oh, wow. So that I could learn the full scope of how to build a robot because, you know, that was my, my dream. Okay, so now I'm going to get totally off script because I think if I'm on the other side of that camera, one of the things I would be thinking of is, you know, what it was it about you? You, you led on that your family also um, benefited you in being able to send you to a private school for most of your, I guess, upbringing in school. Right. But um, do you remember being just a smart kid, a whiz kid? Do you remember, you know, um, somebody singling you out and saying, you know, you're, you're real smart. I think you can do something different. And I just say that because to go on to college and pursue those triple degrees um, says that, you know, you've got a real value and, and work ethic. Um, I've always been driven. Um, and any situation, I'm always going to strive to be the best wherever you place me. I want to be the top. I can't be. <laughs> Second place, <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, I'm going to strive to be the best. So I think I've always had that kind of, uh, that with me. But I think it wasn't until the third or fourth grade where the switch really clicked for me. And I was like, uh, and I can remember one distinct experience. It was um, reading groups. So uh, that started in, uh, I'd say this was probably 98, 99. And then from there, I realized I had an awesome fourth grade year. I, I, mean, I think I won eight awards mm -hmm. at, the eighth, at the fourth grade um, graduate, well, I mean, not graduation, the but the end of the year. Right. Yeah, I got about eight awards from being a part of groups. I was a news anchor, and I just, I loved it. And then playing sports um, gave me another, you know, something to hold on to, um, again, with the groups, with my team, um, being a leader. Um, just again, trying to be the best. Um, I call it now subscribing to greatness. And so what was your uh, K-12 experience here locally? What yeah. schools did you attend? So um, Englehart uh, for pre-K. Okay. So I was there for pre-K and then Jacob um, from my second year of pre-K to um, fourth grade. Okay. And then that's when I um, went to the private school. So I went to St. Helen private okay. school on Crumbs Lane yeah. um, from fifth to eighth grade and then Butler for uh, high school. Excellent, excellent. I'm glad to see that. So that's a real homegrown um, <laughs> genius we have in our midst. My advice to girls who are thinking about getting into STEM fields is to do it. Run towards your passion and don't look back. You can do anything that you want. You can solve big, big social problems using these methods that you learn in STEM. Do not allow challenges and issues that come about to defeat you. I try to look at failure as a learning experience. I always try to have someone that I look up to or someone that can help me with decisions that I'm going through. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. You need to be able to have people who come from different perspectives, and then you can uh, attack a problem in a different way. Hey. Hey. I am a triple threat. That's what I like to call myself. I'm young, I'm black, and I'm female. Woo! Sometimes I walk in a room, and not everybody can relate to me. And I love being able to break down those walls to show them I'm technical, I know what I'm talking about, and we can work together to solve this problem. What is BrainSTEM University? So BrainSTEM One is a, an ed tech startup that is going to inspire the next generation of dreamers, creators, and innovators that are going to solve the problems that we're coming up on as we see and that we're going to um, we continue to have in the future. But what um, we do first off is we provide curriculum for schools, um, and nonprofits, and after school programs with STEM education. So um, most of our curriculum surrounds computer science, robotics, aerospace, and engineering. So um, for instance, um, we provide STEM magnets for schools. So a way for schools to expand their course offerings um, with STEM. So for instance, we offered the aerospace kind of STEM magnet mm -hmm. at your school. And I mean, I can't tell you how amazing that was. And I still see kids today that are like, hey, Astro Man, <laughs> from the right. program that we did there. So that was really awesome. But 
uh, moving in even further, when the pandemic happened, we were doing all of our programming in person. So we rolled out our virtual learning environment. So now we're doing learning online. So we um, have the in-person curriculum that we do with um, nonprofits and schools, but we have our online curriculum that we do with um, direct-to-consumer, with parents, homeschool parents, where students can get involved in a robotics team or a robotics program, a coding class or a coding program. We have an electronics program that we're going to be rolling out. And some of the cool stuff that we have rolling out soon is we're going to be doing some live streaming and games and things like that. And I realized how much parents talked about students being online and what they're, the, the content doing, that they're consuming. Right. Yeah. Well, with BrainStem, we want to provide a place for kids to consume content that is age appropriate, but also entertaining. So right. we're going to be launching BrainStem Live for students to experience live game streaming. So we're going to be streaming some games oh, that are cool, cool to kids, get kids interested in that. But from there, we can actually grab their attention and pull them into, you know, coding. Okay, you like playing this game, like, you want to know how it's made? So right. we'll be doing some things like that to actually pull kids in, get their attention, like I said, and, and interest them in these STEM topics. But more so, like I said, the goal is to inspire kids to end these careers. And like I said, we're building that K through 12 pipeline. And when I talk about the pipeline, that's like I said, we're inspiring them while they're young, giving them something to latch on to in middle school. When they're in middle school, they, they're more able to, you know, right. take these skills and use them to do something with them. So we inspired them in elementary. We've given them skills and ways to use them and taught them how to use these skills, such as programming, electronics, or even podcasting skills or videography <laughs> skills so that they're making their own YouTube channels or, right. or whatever it may be. And then by the time you're in high school, they're like, okay, I know what I want to do. And you have, you know, they have a clear plan. Mm -hmm. So how is BrainStem different for a five-year-old as opposed to 11-year-old? What are they doing differently, or are they doing the same kinds of things? Um, well, I wouldn't say they're all doing the same type of things, but they're still touching the same concepts. As a fifth grader, you're kind of learning and getting familiar with the, the words um, so much. So I'm telling you, uh, this is an operator. This is a loop. This is these different programming techniques are this is um, this electrical this is a volt this is what a volt is and then in middle school you're learning more of the math behind that so you're learning more you're getting into algebra pre-algebra so you can use some of those algebra techniques to solve some of these problems and start to solve for and troubleshoot you know some of these issues so um, and programming we'll use block programming with elementary school kids whereas we're using text-based programming with middle school students um, we're going to use a clicker kind of based, remote based uh, programming robot with our K through two students versus our um, th third to fifth grade students will actually be programming and using blocks to program the robot. So okay. everything's kind of age appropriate. And I guess if you want to be more simple with it, um, the elementary school students are exploring these concepts, just learning about, oh, what's out there? Oh my God, that's cool. They're, we're just getting them excited, and like I said, inspiring them. And then in middle school, they're like, okay, I think that robots are really cool, or I think that digital media is really cool, or I think that gaming is really cool. So now I want to learn how to build games and do animation and build those characters. So we're going to go that track in middle school. Or I want to get into computer science and actually, you know, like write the code for these games or build websites or apps. So I'm going to go on that tr kind of track. Or okay. I'm into electronics and I want to get into the robot, so I'm going to go to electronics and build a robot. So it's just in inspiring them while they're young. When I was growing up, it was always to be Jerry Rice. It was always to be Randy Moss. It was never to be Mark Zuckerberg or some of the other influential characters in technology as they are today. In 2014, African Americans made up between 1 and 6% of the workforce in four of the biggest tech companies, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Facebook. One of my neighbors was a coder. He was a website developer, and he told me that the app market was taking off, and I need to be in the app market. And I didn't know how. I didn't know where to start, C++, Xcode, Swift now. It was foreign language to me. I just sat with this guy, I mean, every day. He had me creating a line of code where the ball would jump across the screen to the other side of the screen. If one line of code out of 30 lines wasn't correct, the entire thing would crash and would call it an error. I started to see that this was something that I could, I could, probably, I could probably do this. So we came up with iFlip. It was a remix application where you could press buttons and uh, sound would come out and it would be, you know, like a DJ experience. 
I picked up the phone, I called my mother, I said, Mom, I want to be a voice for this industry, for people who are coming up behind me. So as an African American on the forefront of that, it helps me to bring up younger minorities to say, you know what, you don't have to be an athlete, you don't have to be a rapper or a singer, you can enter in this industry and create a business from anything and offer a portal through the mobile phone that people can access. my theory, do your best all the time, correct or incorrect, do your best, but like it, like what you're doing, you, then you will do your best, if you don't like it, same on you. If you remember the film Hidden Figures, which I'm sure you do, um, one of the uh, principal players who just passed a few years ago, Katherine Johnson, I looked her up and, and one of the things it said was that she had a bachelor's of science in mathematics. And I think about just how far she went in her career. So um, can you do this work without having a doctorate in computer engineering? Can yes. you do this without going that far? Or what does that look like? Yes, yeah, so that's the beauty of it. And, I, and that's what I try to tell students is, you can you could be making fifty thousand dollars a year, sixteen years old as a programmer, if you you know that good and you pick up those skills. It just takes time, and you have all the time in the world as a teenager to sit down and learn these skills. So, um, no, I think that's the the real beauty of it is one you can sit at home and just take your time and pick up on whatever skill you you want to learn. And with the internet, Upwork and all these you know places where you can sell your skills are, you know, post jobs, you can right. find work uh, easily with uh, some of these tech tech jobs. Okay, interesting. So, how does this continue? Well, let me let me ask it this way. So, you have two boys. Mm -hmm. uh, one's four. Yeah, just turned five. Just turned, okay, yeah. five. So, um, I imagine, you know, all fathers kind of want their kids on their same path or trajectory, mm -hmm. unless you're one of those, you know, real progressive who <laughs> let him be what he wants to be. Um, I imagine with you and your wife, you're a little bit of both. Yep. So, um, what does this look like for, um, what does this look like for a five-year-old in terms of uh, a future path or track in school? Mm -hmm. So, is it... Um, this is something that you hope that they do or continue as uh, an extracurricular path? Is this something that you would, for your own child, see that they get into some sort of science type magnet, a STEM magnet? I mean, using him as an example, what does that look like to make the most of his, you know, really formative years? I think that people have a misconception of like STEM as in, in general and always have it has to be engineering or science but STEM art is STEM and STEM is art and I think that that's one of the things that we have to realize it's all about how you are, are applying those skills um, so I mean I take my sons for for instance Eli the youngest is more artistic I would say than RJ he's more of a type A analytical thinker and um, how I say that both of them are st we're still teaching them STEM and but in their own ways is RJ he may program the a game so we're, we're teaching them programming um, using blocks all of already. course and, yeah <laughs> it's, but it's awesome yes. to see them get into it and like actually in what they what they cling on to so and I'm teaching them both the same program but RJ is picking up on the actual programming and the coding piece mm. of it and Eli he loves the design of the game. So he's designing the characters and designing mm. the, the background and the scene and before he gets into what it's gonna do. So it's, it's, you can expand, um, like I said, into the arts using STEM. So we talk about digital media. That's all STEM. Um, mm -hmm. Production, music, all that's all STEM related. And um, if you're not using STEM with your job or your, um, I mean, looking at using STEM in your career, then you're probably behind in how you're doing that job or that work. So I think that preparing our kids to be um, one digital creators and digital innovators is going to be important. So I think every kid should be in a STEM program. Every kid should be involved in some type of STEM activity. And it shouldn't be an extracurricular. It should be a part of the permanent curriculum because mm -hmm. STEM is the future. And if we're going to prepare our kids for the future, 2030, the jobs of 2030 will all require them to be STEM enabled. 
Well, I think we know that based on what we've seen this past year and how soon we've had to move into a digital world, whether we were prepared or not, and the ones that come out better for it are the ones who really took advantage, I would guess, um, of this time to grow as much as they could. Okay, so I'll be honest. <clears throat> when I think robotics and robots, I think money. I think expensive. Um, this past Christmas season, I remember picking out or going to pick out some toys for some young boys that I knew, and um, I thought Legos. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my son was never really into it. And when I look back now, I don't know if he wasn't into it as I wasn't when I saw the price. Yeah. And I think about that a lot, you know. Um, so talk to me about how, is this an equity issue as well? And, and where do you see that um, playing itself out? And how do we compensate for that? Well, I think it, it is a huge equity issue. I mean, when you look at a Mindstorm kit, about 350 to $450 just for the robot set. And I mean, we that's a game system or something else that you, your kid will play for several years and you don't want to buy that robot set for them to play with for mm -hmm. two weeks and then they're putting it down. And I think that that, is, uh, that has been one of the huge issues. Um, and that's one of the things that I think we're solving by partnering with nonprofits and organizations to provide those you know robots there for the kids to work with and provide these competitions and education for them to work with these robots in a you know that setting and then they can go home and get online and work with these robots digitally so we're creating that like I said a, an, an entire ecosystem for students to participate in STEM education so they came here and played with that expensive robot they went home and they got online and they programmed that same robot digitally so mm -hmm. they get that on both sides and they're competing competing in competitions both in person and online so that online community has meaning when you show up in person to your um, after school program right. um, we can hit more students uh, that way so that's kind of uh, some of the ways that we're trying to deal with that, that equity issue and also I guess to with our robot space adventure program um, the Sphero uh, Bolt robot that we're using is a hundred and fifty dollar robot so that's the competition robot Okay. But what we did as a part of our program, we included the Spiro Mini as a part of the kit. So you pay for the class, you get the robot that the student's going to use, and then they can send us that code to run on a more expensive robot in our lab so mm. that you don't have to worry about the cost of that $150 robot. Right. Yeah. <laughs>
And it's because, why? Your parents aren't getting behind it. They're not showing up to STEM competitions. They're showing up to basketball games. Right. There aren't even STEM competitions for you to show up to. Mm. There's one big robotic competition in JCPS, the Robo Rumble. And that's all the parents do show up to that. There's 500 kids that participate in that program every year. So what we're trying to do is create that like a sport. So robotics will be a sport in the mm. school. We'll have robotics league and robotics seasons. So students can participate and we get parents out and we get parents pushing that. And when you can get um, more excitement and more people behind that, uh, just like a, a football team, if you have your robotics team and people yes. are showing up cheering them on as they yes. win these competitions, and I guarantee you we'll see that change. And as we see these students start to receive scholarships and more notoriety, and they're viewing them streaming online, coding, and can, I mean, as you see those kids um, in Louisville just made a half a million dollars <laughs> yes. <laughs> on TikTok yes. by coding yes. LED lights. Yes. So when students see that, I think that that gives them, you know, a reason to want to learn these skills. So we need to like get behind that more and show um, what you can do with these skills, but also cheer these kids on, um, provide more opportunities for these kids to participate in these um, robotics competitions in hackathons. I had to go all the way to Boulder, Colorado to participate in a hackathon. Oh, wow. You know, where um, companies were there sponsoring, you know, kids. They're putting up $5,000 prizes, $10,000 prizes, $2,000 prizes, sorry, for students to write programs, you know. Right. So that's what we need, um, and that's what BrainSTEM is looking to provide for our kids. More opportunities to participate in STEM competitions, STEM um, programming and you know STEM conventions to actually get them like I said inspired and get more people looking at them for having these STEM skills and showing off their STEM skills so um, we're looking at doing like drone leagues we're gonna do a rocket um, team so we're gonna be doing things like that to like I said inspire these kids to learn more about these STEM uh, concepts well, you are inspiring me, um, you know, makes me want to go back and start all over and maybe start in STEM. But let me ask you this. Um, how can we as a community get behind you and support to get the word out and, and make this BrainSTEM University as big a part of our community as our AAU basketball, football leagues and all that comes with that? Yeah, well, first, let's get a STEM program, our STEM competition, our STEM team at all of our churches and community centers. I think that's an mm. easy way to do it. They, most of our churches have space. Most of them have computer labs. So why not have a STEM program at our community centers and churches for all of our students to participate in? I think that's, um, that would be awesome. And each of, the, each of our neighborhoods, the neighborhoods that our churches sit in mm -hmm. are the neighborhoods that we need to impact mostly. So I think we can do that through uh, partnering with uh, our churches and community organizations um, there. Secondly, schools. 50% of schools don't have a calculus program across the United States. So wow. that's a gateway to STEM education, I mean, in college. I mean, for me, I did not have, I could not take calculus my freshman year because my ACT wasn't high enough. I didn't take calculus in high school. So mm. I didn't know that I needed to take algebra as an eighth grader to even prepare to take calculus in high school. So um, these are the things that we need to be preparing our students for and the skills that we need to be preparing our students with. But when does it start? It starts in elementary. If your student is ahead of the game when they get to middle school, then they can take algebra in the eighth grade. But if they're just on track in the sixth grade, then they're going to be taking pre-algebra and be on the, the same track as everyone else. They're not on the STEM track. Right. And if we're saying that we want to prepare, like I said, our kids for the future, then we're going to put our kids on a STEM track so that they're prepared for the jobs in 2030 and not preparing for jobs of today. That's right. Okay, so I'm excited because you are a true example to our community. You're a true example to our students. I would not have him on the show if I had not seen the work that he did first and foremost up front with the kids at our school and just how he transformed lives. I am sure that there were some children in that school that participated in uh, the program that are changed forever because of that experience. And we want the same thing for your children. We want the same thing for your grandchildren. Now is the time. You heard them. Let's find a way to get BrainSTEM University in all of our churches and our community centers. And let's make it for the benefit of our entire community. I am so pleased that you were on the show today. It was everything that I would have expected it to be. I am um, just eternally grateful that we have this excellent resource in our community. So let's use them up while we still have the chance. 
It's been a great show. You've been a great audience. I'm Michelle Penix, or Principal Penix to most. It's a huge thank you for tuning in, and as always, to God be the glory.